Welcome to Green Team Speaks To, the podcast for the Paulson Institute's Green Finance Center. I'm Deborah Lair, Vice Chairman and Executive Director of the Paulson Institute. Today, we're so fortunate to have David Craig, co-chair of the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosures, founder and former CEO of Revenitive, and an executive fellow at the London Business School joining us. David is a leader with 30 years of experience in the field of finance, data, and infrastructure for sustainability. David, welcome to the Green Team Speaks To podcast. It's a pleasure to have you joining us today. You're a trailblazer driving the essential and timely work of the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosures. With your background as the founder and CEO of Refinitive, you bring a much-needed discipline of data and knowledge of technology to the challenging work of valuing nature. I'm really looking forward to our discussion today. The Paulson Institute issued a report, Financing Nature, Closing the Global Biodiversity Financing Gap, that calls attention to the massive loss of biodiversity the world is facing and its links to economic activity. In our report, we found that 30 to 50% of all species may be lost by the middle of the 21st century. This biodiversity loss will also lead to tremendous economic loss. The decline in pollinators, birds, bees, and bats, for example, could lead to a drop in agriculture output of about 220 billion annually. Add in the secondary impact of grains for feeding livestock, and the number could be as high as 500 billion. The world's economic output heavily depends on nature. At the same time, we're experiencing nature degradation and biodiversity loss at an unprecedented pace. To address the substantial risks of biodiversity loss, governments play an important role as they need to stop subsidizing bad behaviors, but the private sector plays a critical role as well. The launch of the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosures is an important step in the right direction. David, first, start by talking to us about the Task Force. Well, thank you very much, Deborah, and it's a great pleasure to join you on this uh, podcast. The Task Force is an industry-led initiative. Um, We have now over 400 members from the financial community, asset managers, asset owners, investors, and the banks. We have also in that 400 many corporations, uh, the types of companies that are experiencing nature-related risks or opportunities because of their production systems that, that you mentioned. Plus, we have the scientific community and also standards bodies and regulators. We have um, 34, if you like, roll up your sleeves, uh, design members who are really working hard the, the evenings and weekends to, to get this done. So we've collected the, the group of the market that really have the knowledge, the will, the expertise to try and create a market design framework, really to understand how to assess, how to manage, how to respond to nature-related risks and opportunities and and how to disclose better data about how they're managing this risk so the financial community can act, can understand, has more transparency and ultimately redirect financial investments away from some of those damaging and harmful issues uh, around nature to more what we call nature positive outcomes. Well, one of the things that we found in our report is you could almost address 50% of the financing gap needed just by changing those subsidized bad behaviors towards positive ones. So the data really is important here. And we often hear discussions around nature being considered a free good and that it's very hard to put a value on nature. How do you look at that as somebody who has such an expertise in looking at these data related issues? Well, I think what companies are realizing is that they, as your report shows, have very large dependencies on on nature or what we call in the technical jargon, the ecosystem service. The company is learning that it may have dependency on pollination, for example, or the provision of fresh water or the fertility and productive capability of, of earth. And so by running through this process and actually analyzing more what is my production system? Where are my revenues coming from? My products, where are my cost lines from? And where do I have dependencies on ecosystem services that I need to be aware of? Um, Allows you, even even though there isn't a perfect valuation mechanism for, for nature, and lots of people talk about how do we put a value on nature, our methodology enables companies to step through location by location and say, well, where are my dependencies on these ecosystems and the ecosystem services? Uh, and also, where are my impacts on these ecosystem services? Where am I actually uh, using mineral-based fertilizer or possibly 
polluting water streams or taking a lot of water out of the water basin. So it allows you to kind of start mapping through in a very methodical way dependencies impacts that lead to risks and opportunities and ultimately enterprise value. So I think people who are looking for that sort of perfect numerical methodology will be disappointed. But the pragmatists that can actually step through your business and operating model and say, well, where are those dependencies? Where are those impacts? What we've delivered is a methodology for how to do that to enable you to actually conduct that really important risk management assessment for nature-related risks. Well, which is critically important as we then turn to how do you create those kinds of structures, right? Whether it's through policy or through various kinds of incentive for, for channeling in private sector money and calculating the risk. So what are the kinds of recommendations that you're making to governments? Well, we're first and foremost making sure that the, the market is creating something that takes a very complicated topic. Um, much has been said about the complexity of nature and biodiversity. You know, whilst all of us are trying to understand the complexity of climate, and I'll come on to the relationship between the two, mm-hmm. you know, it is more complex to understand nature and biodiversity risks and how to manage that. So we're taking that complexity and trying to structure it and simplify it to a way that corporations and financial institutions can run through a step-by-step process and understand where those dependencies and where those impacts are. So for example, we've defined 34 distinct biomes, if you like, types of ecosystems under four realms, land, freshwater, ocean, and atmosphere, and, and helped companies navigate then a taxonomy, if you like, for the nature and business interface so that we can step through, we can understand where my locations are, where are those biomes, and step through that methodology. So really breaking it down into a set of steps, a common language, a common terminology, tries to help you know, fight the complexity challenge that, that is there to try and make this simple, but scientifically rigorous. So that's the first step. The second step is making sure that we've got the scientific community supporting as well. There's been decades of research and new research every day around the impact of nature, the state of ecosystems, some of the issues around the world. And so making sure that we've got a rigorous and market-led framework that is informed by strong science and scientific basis is really important because it's very important that the scientific community supports what we're doing, supports the financial institutions and the corporations in doing that. With governments then, um, the conversation is around a a number of areas. I mean, clearly they're recognising that nature risk is something that they can't run away from. We're seeing nature risk in food prices um, right now in many, many other areas. So they are very interested in the development and the status of the work. They're keen to see that we have something that is a global framework, a, a global approach that can be used in many, many different different countries around the world. Ultimately, I think regulators will pick up the principles of the TNFD and like TCFD, they will ask and request that companies follow this risk management framework and these guidelines, and they'll start to incorporate in their their risk approach and their disclosure approach as well. So for us, it's that sort of three-phase approach. The scientific community is this market robust and market design so that we've taken that complexity and boiled it down. And then do we have governmental support and also governmental standards around disclosures and regulations that can mean that there's a fair and level playing field for how we manage this type of risk? Right. So you you mentioned earlier climate change and the relation of climate change and biodiversity. And we often hear from individuals that we need to address climate change first, and then we can turn to biodiversity. I mean, I do hear this a lot. And it is true that there are at least, I think, five consultations around the world in financial markets for climate change standards at the moment. So people are quite focused and very busy on dealing with these consultations. But you really can't treat them as separate issues. Now, I'll explain why. And there really are two sides of the same coin. When you start looking at um, physical risks from climate change, yes, there's damage to buildings and structures and flood damage and many other areas. But the biggest and most harmful damage at the moment is to the natural production system. So droughts are creating um, a lack of rainfall and droughts are creating impact to the harvests. We've seen like in India that happen. We're seeing an extreme weather affect other production systems. We're seeing shortage of water in places like California or parts of Asia as well, really affecting not just food production, but manufacturing and the production systems as well. So when you start looking at physical risk, you immediately start looking at natural risk. And what we're finding is that the climate change that we're experiencing is accelerating the natural degradation that we've been creating anyway. So we have this acceleration process happening at a very time when the most effective and efficient ways of absorbing CO2 and equivalents from the atmosphere are nature-based. The mechanical sequestration of CO2 is 
both expensive and not yet at scale in most areas. Um, and therefore, we're going to have to rely on planting new forests or savannas or seagrass or the other methods of natural-based absorption of CO2. So there are three direct intersects between climate, nature and biodiversity that we have to look at holistically. Many of the members in the TNFD actually think about climate and nature together. They haven't separated them in terms of teams and how they're assessing them. And we very intentionally designed the TNFD FRIS framework using TCFD so one could follow on into the other. Oh, very clever. Well, this leads to a very basic question too, David. Why is disclosure an important part of the solution? Well, disclosure is what I would call necessary, but not sufficient. It, it is very helpful. It's important to do risk management first, but then to demonstrate the outcome of that assessment and that um, view of your risks using disclosures. So I think disclosures and data for the sake of data, sometimes those can lead to the wrong outcomes. If you've got a very strong risk management approach, what disclosure does is a couple of things. One, it demonstrates accountability. Uh, what gets measured gets managed. And if you declare metrics around a certain ecosystem service or a certain dependency, you're then declaring an intent to manage against that. And so that's very important. I think the second thing is it gives comparability. So if you're a financial investor, you can look across companies in the same sector. You can look between sectors and say, well, how are they thinking about land use? How are they thinking about their dependency? Dependency on pollination services or use of water or those things to get a perspective either between two companies or across sectors, which is which is really, really helpful. But I think it's got to be done in the context of a risk management framework, not just if you like picking metrics out of the air um, to disclose against. And how have you found the reception to it within the financial and the business community? Well, I think the reception is is very strong. The interest and the support that we've had from across the world really on TNFD has been Warming from the G7 support we had last June to G20. The G7 support has been iterated again just two weeks ago. But then from the member response, I mean, we've had over 400 people sign up to the forum of TNFD. We have um, 34, if you like, roll up your sleeves, uh, design members who are really working hard uh, the evenings and weekends to, to get this done. And people are very busy. The sustainability community is very busy at the moment on climate and nature and biodiversity. So it's a great testament to the fact that people really, really believe and see that there's an issue here and that they can't run away from this. That I think Think you're seeing this real conviction um, from the industry to get behind this and do that. Do we have everyone on board yet? No. Um, do we have a lot more work to do? Yes, of course we do. But I think from a 12-month run, there's been amazing support and acceleration of the framework in the market, much more than I even thought we would get. I think it's critically important that companies sign on to this. It's an essential part of the solution because we need data and information to begin to assess solutions. And certainly policymakers need to be able to have that kind of data to make the necessary policies, because we do believe this is an area where government needs to be very involved in the solution. Let's talk a little bit about technology. And one of the things we've we've worked on at the Paulson Institute is how we can be using fintech to help with green finance. And China has been, been actually creating even uh, bio free trade zones to look at some of the ways that they can start to look at biodiversity and financing. What do you see as the use of technology? Is this going to be a very useful tool in the future? It is. It's going to be essential. And spatial data in particular, and new instrumentation methods for collecting data, but also new analytics methods for analyzing and processing large data sets are going to be absolutely critical. And the good news is that they're developing now very, very quickly. So even in the 12 months that I've been chairing the TNFD, I've seen a explosion, if you like, of data companies, both commercially backed, governmental backed NGO backed into this space and, and some have been around for a, for a long time in fact the idea of spatial data is really not that new my old firm Refinitiv like Bloomberg and others were tracking ships production systems crops and commodities for traders um, for a long time tools like Encore from the UN, um, Natural Capital Finance Alliance, Global Forest Watch, Ocean Watch, you know, many other tools, Global Mangrove Watch have been developing to give spatial analysis of ecosystem sensitivities and, and areas. And there are many, many more. In fact, in our data assessment, our first relief, we found over 50 companies. We're re-releasing that paper. The number is well over 100. So, you know, what's happening here is couple of things there. Um, there were 1,200 low orbit satellites launched in 2020. So a massive increase on the year before, and you're seeing a lot more satellite technology there in low orbit uh, that can literally take, you know, mappings through either visual or infrared or 
other technologies on a daily basis. So you're not only getting sort of one-off data sets, but you're getting regular data sets um, updated. You also have technologies like digital twins, where you can literally create a digital model of the ecosystem that you're in and model its behaviors and its history and its sensitivities. Seeing companies like Downforce from Oxford Based Trust doing that. You're getting a lot more what I call temporal consistency. So, you know, accurate time periods of data being, being set apart. You're also getting new technologies to measure biodiversity um, as well. eDNA, environmental DNA is a tracking method that can do that. Um, we've even come across a company that is putting microphones across a whole area of land and listening and using machine learning to listen to the noises that animals make and detecting the, the animal health according to the season and the period. So it's quite um, extraordinary technology is coming to bear now, um, creating a lot more data, but a lot more ability to process that data as well and giving companies a much, much easier way of looking at it. There are lots of gaps. Um, it's still quite a manual process, but I actually am very optimistic that we'll see not just more and better data, but more automation to allow companies to do this. It just It's a astonishing what technology can do now. We were hearing of an example recently where artificial intelligence and facial recognition can be used in fish farms and they can recognize the individual fish and track their health. And so even if, if there's like a flood, they can go in and then they have records of which of those were grown organically sort of in the fish farm versus which ones were out in the wild. It's, it's astonishing what technology is doing. So as you look ahead, uh, what do you see as some of the challenges, but also what gives you hope? I think a couple of challenges that I, I talk about. One is in order to really look at nature and biodiversity risk properly, you've got to understand uh, your location. I call it know your ecosystem. And, and what do we really mean by that? When you look at carbon emissions, you have to have a level of understanding about your supply chain and where those emissions are. But to an extent, you don't necessarily need to worry exactly where those emissions are taking place because CO2 contributes to a global atmospheric pollution of CO2. Whereas with nature and biodiversity, you really do have to get very specific about the locations that you're in, you know your ecosystem. And it means that for companies who haven't started that yet, there's quite a long journey in building that type of capability. It's, you know, it's great to get these spatial maps and these ecosystem maps and these services, but you've really got to understand not just where my operations are, but where are my upstream supply chain and where's that coming from and sourcing as well as my downstream. So I think that's one of the big challenges um, that people have. Um, I think I think another challenge is whilst we're all very focused on dependencies and impacts and nature related risks, we don't have that kind of crisp 1.5 target for mm -hmm. nature that you have with temperature rise and climate change. That is coming. It's been pushed by the Convention on Biological Diversity, the CBD or the COP15, um, as it's known, to get over 170 countries trying to agree a set of targets for the world and to put some more clarity and measurability on what do we mean by nature positive. So the World Wildlife Fund has set up nature positive by 2030. The future state of our ecosystems and biodiversity is in a better state than it is now. But what exactly does that mean? And what are the targets that we need to set it? So I think those are two gaps that um, hopefully will be filled soon. So like we did with climate, once you have a, a target of 1.5 degree, then we can shoot towards that. Now, it's always going to be more complex with nature and biodiversity. There will not be 1.5 degree target. It might be targets, for example, 30% of all land set aside by 2030. But those are the things that we need to really, I think, gear people into action to do this. And I then think the other gap and something that we're focused on is transition. There's lots of talk about transition in, in climate to transition away from high carbon production and energy energy systems, but what's the transition look like in nature, I think is broader, more complex, but in some way more exciting, because you're looking at, you know, whole different ways of producing things in a more nature positive way. If I take an example of Tetra Pak mm -hmm. um, in the Nordics has moved to 100% plant based recyclable packaging from plastic packaging, and they'll complete that journey in 2022 this year. Now, they're clearly ahead of the pack, but it goes to show that, you know, this can be done, but it does take a, a complete relook at your production supply chain and how it operates. And how about on the hope? What is it that gives you hope? You know, there's a crisis, and I think people are generally recognizing. Uh, that there is a crisis. I also am amazed by the amount of technological innovation that is happening. 
not just in the data and technology and monitoring space, but in new production methods, vertical farming, for example, and whole food systems that can be housed inside with the advanced technology of LEDs to power them and these other areas. I think the problem is they're quite small scale at the moment. And one of the challenges that we've got to try and solve is, well, how do we get finance interested in some of these investments at scale? How do we how do we kickstart that transition, if you like, to, to turn a lot of support and care and concern about the nature and natural environment that everyone has into real meaningful change from the damaging methods that we use today into some of the more nature positive ones that we have. The, the technology is evolving. It's not all there yet. Um, the money is there, but it doesn't quite know how to invest in it yet. So I think there's a whole set of things that will have to come together quite quickly if we're going to if we're going to get there. And if if our listeners were interested in being helpful in an effort, what are the kinds of things that individuals can be doing in terms of helping with this cause. It's very funny. One of the reasons I got involved in this is my son said to me, he's 14, and he said to me about a year ago, he said, Dad, you've made a living selling ESG data. What are you now going to do to save the planet? And I thought it was a very good <laughs> child moment. When they look at you and say, well, how does that really help? And he had a point. And I, I, one of the things that we've done is actually as a family, look at our own consumption and the amount of meat that we're eating, the fish that we're eating, where things are coming from. And I think everyone can start to do that from it. But I think for companies, a couple of things I would do, I wouldn't let the perfect, the, the fact that it's not perfect yet, and no perfect framework exists, stop you from taking action. The TNFD framework in its first release was done in March. And it gives a very good how-to guide for how to start this assessment process of nature-related risks that many, many people around the world are piloting right now. So we'd welcome anyone to be involved in that, to join the forum and to pilot the TNFD framework and give us that rapid feedback that we're looking for in the timescales that we have. And then I think the other thing is skills. Um, and we don't talk enough about skills and talent in these big change areas, but we need to train and educate a whole raft of new leaders to understand climate and nature and our dependencies upon them. And, and we can't all hunt down the same experts in this. We have to start training and educating people. One of my other roles is at London Business School, but we're also working with many business schools in Singapore and North America to try and get more established and formal education programs going so that we can start to educate leaders. Because what's happening is this is not a side event. This is not ESG around the edge. This is core now to our valuation models and how we run our business is understanding the full life cycle of the products and the energy systems and, and what we're using. So we have to build that into the core of our management team. So those are three things that I think everyone can start doing now. Well, David, this has been an incredibly informative discussion. We really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. We are such supporters of the work that you and your colleagues are doing at TNFD and really to help in, in finding innovative ways to be saving the planet, both at an individual level, but also at a corporate and government level. So thank you for joining us, but thank you also for your work. Well, thank you very much, Deborah, and thank you everyone from the Boston Institute as well. And um, I look forward to working together on this critical problem. Thank you for joining us on Green Team Speaks To. To listen to more episodes and learn more about the Paulson Institute's work in green finance, please visit us at paulsoninstitute.org. See you next time.